Bad luck bananas, the idea behind this thing is there's this toy, the Bogman from the 80s, and that's what it looks like in the case. Does anyone remember this toy? No? You guys weren't born yet? Uh, one person remembers. Anyways, I had one of these things when I was a kid, and I thought it was cool, and I always imagined if it actually came to life, what would happen. And anyways, now as an adult, in a certain physical form at least, um, thought it would be cool to bring this thing to life, so that's kind of the idea behind it. But don't tell a story unless there's a meaning behind it, and don't do effects in the film unless there's a purpose for it. You know, there's nothing worse than watching a film that's just a bunch of effects and there's no point to it. And there's nothing worse than wasting your time doing a film if there's no real meaning to it. So I had to find a kind of meaning behind it. And um, the bad luck bananas thing, bringing bananas on a boat, it's a myth that fishermen will tell you, anyone that does it professionally knows it. If you go online, countless other people will tell you stories about bad weather, engine troubles, and so on, attributed to bringing bananas on a boat. It started back in the 18th century. Um, basically, there's a lot of reasons why, but one is invasive species were <coughs> brought in on the bananas, primarily spiders. Spiders would bite the sailors, sailors would die, ship rolls in port, and you know a bunch of people are dead so other things happen different bacteria and stuff were brought in from the bananas so basically invasive species is the thing that i thought was important that we need to address and i've seen this throughout this is diving uh, on lake huron this is a wreck this one's called the mary alice and you can just see this thing littered with zebra and quagga mussels just completely everything on there those are invasive mussels and they're just terrible to the Great Lakes. It's the most intense ecological change recorded in the history of the Great Lakes. And what they do is they eat all the plankton. That's the basis of the food chain. And that's why we don't have the population of fish that we used to have. And it's dangerous for divers. You can see that reel that I was holding on to in this image. And here's wrapping it around inside. This is another wreck. This is called the Regina. It's the real name of the ship. And this is about 75 feet deep. There's no light inside of this area. Those are artificial light from the um, diving lights, but the muscles are still there. They can cut your dive lines. They can cut your skin. Um, it's terrible. It gets in drains. It gets in your boat engines. Um, they're a terrible pro problem. And you can transport them in a drop of water. There could be a thousand of them in a drop of water. And people, don't realize how bad certain invasive species are. And so I thought it was important seeing it firsthand. And the only fish that I saw that was not invasive was this burbot. The whole weekend, diving several wrecks um, inside of the Regina. Really cool fish, only one. I actually saw it twice. But can anyone guess the only other fish that I saw? Several of them in the Great Lakes when I was doing these dives. Can anyone guess? No, no, it's invasive, I'll give you a hint. Yeah. Gobies. Gobies. Those stinking round gobies right there. Those are invasive too. Saw a bunch of them. Uh, apologize for the picture. This is my first time wreck diving, getting certified, so it's not the greatest. There's a couple of them here, but these are invasive too. So what happens when these invasive species come is they eat all the plankton and the other things that the other fish would eat, and it's just terrible, and I, I didn't... There was barely any life. Normally, you go to a healthy ecosystem, it looks more like this. This was earlier this year, waters of Cosmo, Mexico. And look how beautiful that is. That's with the same Panasonic camera. Um, but it's a balanced ecosystem. In one frame, you can see everything. Top predator, barracuda, smaller fish, coral, um, algal growth, a healthy amount. When those zebra mussels come in, um, they clear the water, more algae grows. They, give waste to the water, detritus they expel, and bacteria grows. So this is what it should look like. Obviously this is salt water, but some salt water creatures, like you mentioned earlier, the sea lamprey, they come here, they become invasive. So we do, we need to look for ecosystems like this. We're gonna look at a clip of a healthy ecosystem in Minnesota from Hook and Look in a little bit here. But this is what our waters in the Great Lakes should look like. 20% of the world's fresh water is here and it doesn't look as beautiful as it should. So I think it's an important cause. So I wrote the script and played on the fun, bad luck bananas thing. And then 
we had to figure out what does this puppet actually do. Here's an inside look of the puppet. Um, the middle finger here can move up and down, and that moves the eyes left and right. You can take your thumb and your pointer finger and open the mouth, and then the eyelids. You can use your other two fingers here to move the eyelids open and close. So this is what it does out of the box. And then you need to figure out what else can this puppet do. This was a children's toy in 1987. Isn't that sweet? This is a children's toy now. You just want to see? Looks like that, <laughs> right? Um, well, this is, this is a children's toy. So I just thought it was really cool and I wanted to bring it to life. How else can I make this thing move? I did some screen test here. Um, there was a couple wires here, but the arms didn't move. And when you're doing any kind of animation, you have to think about, you know, what would this creature look like if it was moving in real life? I'd have to imagine that. Um, and I tried different rigging options. And I figured the tail would move kind of like a cuttlefish of a, of a fish, cuttlefin, to project it forward. The arms would crawl, sort of like a zombie crawl forward. And that's how I wanted it to move. I'd figure out how to do that. And ended up going with this sort of a similar rig. Um, there's a ball on the bottom so it has a smooth surface to roll on the surface of the boat. There was a weight to keep it from flipping forward. And then there was these dowels on the sides. This is the full setup here. And you might have noticed I bought two of these things on eBay. Um, so we would have stunt doubles. <laughs> stunt doubles are important. Um, but I had them rigged for different scenes and stuff. And we did have to swap them out a bit. So that's how we ended up having it move. And then we had to have it lunge onto the boat. They want to lunge this weight on Kim's boat or I'd be in trouble. So um, this is another ball that obviously you probably tell, hey, that doesn't look right. So try to glue some stuff in there, have some fun. Uh, doing your brush with nature, I've seen Heiner paint hundreds of times mixing oil paints. I'm like, no, I'm going to give it a try. I gave it a try, tried to mix that color, put it on the plastic, and I kind of thought, you know what, this might not actually dry in time. A couple days, a week went by. It would not cure. No, I didn't want to go out, spend the extra money on this no budget educational film. And so I had to do plan B. I, I ripped that off and I ended up just using the palette paper and put that on the ball. And just, it's, so when I threw it on the boat, you, you didn't see a frame that looked weird. So just some behind the scenes stuff. If you can do it practically, it'll save you a lot of time in post. And when you're doing something in 4K, like this production, it takes a lot of processing time and a lot of rendering time and a lot of re-rendering and something like this can save you a lot of time. So try to do it practically doing stuff like that. Do storyboards, talk about it all the time. Here's a storyboard, some of the shots. Again, we only had a couple hours to do this whole thing on the boat. It was raining, it's cold, and we wanted to get it done quickly. So the floor plan here, it's looking down vertically. That's typical for floor plans. You can see the camera position. And then I could see what angles that we're going to see with the puppet. What angles do I need to get it to move and so on. So just took some pictures. It didn't take very long to do this. So very important to storyboard. Here's another version. Arrows indicate the movement so I know the screen direction. And I knew ahead of time before we got there. She's got to run this way. He's got to stand here on the right side of the frame. Bobbin's got to throw it to the left. Saves so much time. Here are some underwater shots. Um, that's not Abby's foot, by the way. You know, it might look a little different. Um, so yeah, I just took a camera, took some quick pictures, add some arrows, save so much time. Uh, and then I did the floor plan a little differently because we were underwater in three dimensions. Shot it horizontally, it's a different perspective, different orientation, that's just another tip. If you're doing something in 3D program or whatever where it's not flat down orientation, this helped me a lot know what angles to get. All right, so we shot it out, um, you know, as we were all talking about earlier, here's a behind the scenes image uh, from the production. You know, everything <coughs> went pretty good. Besides, you know, it was in the 70s or 80s, we got out there, it's raining, it's like 40 some degrees. <laughs> that was the first strike of a banana. And so we did a production, all the shots went great. Ernie told the story earlier about what happened with the underwater stuff. So we had to go back out. Without Kim's boat, we had two kayaks. We went out and we had to shoot the shots with Abby, a different location quickly with the kayak. 
um, in order to make up for the lost time. So let's look at some of the effect shots already. This is a before shot. You can see a couple problems here. The environment's different. This was a different camera. This was a GoPro camera, super wide lens. And also you can see my arm in the shot with the wetsuit on. So we gotta remove that. So there is the fixed shot, arm completely removed and displacement mapped the picture so that it no longer looks warped, fisheye. It looks more like a regular image. And at the same time, it got rid of those trees in the background. So that is one sort of effect shot they ended up doing. Object distortion there. And here's just another example of the same thing. These were done frame by frame, by the way, in Photoshop. So the way that I edited this film and a lot of other pieces like this, Premiere Pro primarily used Adobe products. All the editing was done in Premiere. It was super easy, really fast. Boom, nothing. It was done. A few hours, maybe, not even. It's this kind of stuff that takes more time. And it has to look good when you go frame by frame so it doesn't have that weird-looking um, stencil image. I can't think of the terminology for it right now. But it has to look good when you play 30 frames next to each other. This was shot 2997 frames. It was not 24 frames or 14 frames. This was full 30 frames a second. Um, this is a shot on the boat, deck of the boat. You can see the dowels. And this is what it looked like straight out of the camera. Remove them using Photoshop. If you don't know Photoshop and you want to do this work, don't even touch compositing program until you know Photoshop inside and out. Best program for a compositor. I don't care what other program you use. Photoshop is king. You can even edit videos in it if you want to. But Photoshop is what I use there. Here's some with the final grade with a little bit of environmental effects. Wanted to do some fog. Wanted to do some CG fog. Talked to a couple people that were going to do that. If you don't have a budget, it's kind of hard. Um, and so I just added some real fog that was screen, different blending mode to get the fog in there to make it a little bit darker, more ambient. So here's another example. This is object distortion. This is in After Effects. Uh, I primarily did the effects in After Effects in Photoshop, a little bit in Premiere if I could. This is a before shot. So you can see the rod, obviously it's not bending. First, you have to remove the element, and that might have been done in Photoshop, I don't know. Part of the rod is still there. You have to motion track that footage to see where the rod is moving along with it. Motion track it, um, and then you have to reapply that motion tracking data to the new layer of the rod that's bending. There's a tool called Puppet Tool in After Effects. So that was animated using that tool. Makes a mesh out of the layer, very basic. Uh, and then I also had to mask out Kim's hand so it goes over the new pole there bending. All right, so that was one thing. And then this is the final version of motion track, adding that puppeted animation in to have the rod bent. Sound effects played a big role in that too, here in the line screech off and so on. Um, sound design is very important, visual presentations. But that's how that was achieved. This was a fun one to do. This is. This is color graded, but this is the shot of the Boglin, and this is what it looked like for real. One of the cool things about this as a kid, the eyes glowed. It, you can barely see, and I had this underwater light. We were shining it in the Boglin's eyes. It wouldn't show up that well. I'm like, I ah, don't worry about it. I can do it in post. It only take 20 hours, but I'll do it in post. It'll be fine. <laughs> no, I didn't take that long. But. So I made these eyes glow a little bit. That looks a lot cooler, but I'm like, you know what? This is for a cigarette event. That's not going to cut it. So made some volumetric lighting, kind of projecting out a bit. And you can see when it swims away, it projects out a little bit. Um, and that's kind of what it looks like over black, just so you can see. And that is using most, some of the most basic visual effect techniques that you need to know, which is masking, mask out the frames for the eyes, and then used different effects you know, to end up with that. So that's another lighting simulation effect rotoscoping. I like to do stuff by hand. There's all sorts of fancy tools that they have in there, a roto brush tool, all sorts of stuff. But I like the old-fashioned roto tools. It seems to work the best for me, that the a tool. Um, so here's a shot straight out of the camera. This is about what it looked like. It looks beautiful, but you have to make your images look 
works when you're doing filmmaking to make it look scarier and so on. You gotta dirty it up. So this is a affected version, made it a little more somber looking, a little bit spookier. You can see the before and after. Uh, again, this was all done in 4K. This projector is only HD, so you can't see the difference, but it's kind of fun to see the difference between the 4K version and the HD version because you can see every speck of everything. It's, it's pretty amazing. This is the old version. This is the standard def DVD, those of you that go to Redbox and stuff. This is what you're getting. So it's like, what is it, 16 times more information you've got to process, more pixels you have to adjust in Photoshop. It's a lot of work, but the results are pretty cool. So if you guys have a 4K monitor at home, you can watch the full version when it's done. And then graphics. Graphics are a huge thing, and I tell my students all the time, just because you got one version done, it doesn't mean you're done. This was an early draft, and I don't even know what iteration this was. But obviously, you changed the name. This was one design. You got to redesign, even when you've been doing this a while. So I'll design it again. Here's another version. Um, made the word bananas kind of look like the shape of a banana on this one. Got rid of the word curse. It's too wordy. Here's another version with an actual banana. It's a clipping mask in the background and then adjusted with some highlight shadows to make it more apparent, but wasn't as clean as this, so this was the final version. Also got rid of the yellow in the background and stuff, um, just so that uh, bottom and pops a little bit more. <coughs> Do multiple drafts of your graphic work. Very important, um, just because it's done, a version that's done doesn't mean you're done. Show your client multiple versions, uh, so on and so forth. Did original scores for this. Everything you heard was originally done for this. Um, I love music. I started doing music before I started playing with cameras and stuff. Don't get to do it as much, so it was fun to do that. Um, some of the instruments were organic, real electric guitar, classical guitar at the end. Jamie sang at the end, so that was cool. Um, but this is Pro Tools. This is a program um, that we, we use over in the sound design class, and it's it's the only program that's not Adobe that we used um, that's good for doing MIDI instruments, virtual instruments. You have the timpani and all that sort of stuff, and I don't have timpani at home yet, but <laughs> um, it's fun to use original music, and it helps your effects seem more real. It sets the mood. It's really important to do that sort of stuff. So pre-production and training is super important. You saw the storyboards. You saw the floor plan. Um, trying to investigate something that's worth making a film about. That was all important. And we didn't just go out there and um, do these things, you know, getting proper training um, in pools, getting your certifications. I don't even know how many scuba certs I have now, but you got to go out there, get certified, um, go in a pool, do it. Don't just go out there with a garden hose or something, you know, trying to take pictures with your GoPro. It's not very uh, safe. Well, I'm not going to talk too much more about safety. Uh, Rick is going to do that in a minute here. Real quick though, um, the other thing that we were able to use to communicate underwater is the underwater communication systems. And um, I have a video to show with that. This is from our, the, the show Hook and Book that Kim hosts. And this is how we can use the technology to communicate with each other. Because the other idea behind tonight is what technology is available to do things practically, to make these productions more safe and so on. And without these full phase underwater communication systems, we wouldn't have been able to do the show as it is. And it would have been a lot harder to do the underwater footage for Battle of Bananas. Did it anyways with a kayak. But it makes it more safe, especially when you're doing this all day on the water for, for several days. So let's take a look at this. Quick, uh, and James, do you mind getting the lights real quick? This is a <clears throat> segment. This is unreleased yet, so I'm gonna have to ask you to turn your cell phones off, no recording. It's fun to go on to a shoot with our producers and see the effort that they put into it because it's not easy shooting a fishing show, and when you add the whole scuba diving underwater element, it takes it to a new level of complexity. Well, let's take a look at this, guys. <laughs> I've probably fished this dock for 10 years. I've never seen underneath it. I'm excited to see what you find. I got a big school of bluegill here. You're right at the beginning of these uh, five canopies that are pretty deep, so I'm excited to hear what you find underneath those. Oh, there's a nice rock spout. 
How big is he? How big was the walleye? I was about to say, I mean, he was about, oh, I'd say, 19 inches or so. I got another nice large mouth here, about two and a half pounds. And a big pig. This one's probably four or better. This one's a pig. He's a good actor. Kim, what's he holding on to? Is he just sitting out in the open or suspended? Just hanging. I mean, this one's a pig, and he's a great actor. I'm getting good close-ups. I want to give him a close-up of my wacky worm. <laughs> this mallard's a big fan of your show. Kim, I bet all the times I fish these docks, I'm just not going deep enough. These fish looks like they're holding back to the wall and they're very hard to get to with all these boats but i know next time i come here i'm going to have to work harder to get the baits back further i think you're right hey this is what hook and lock is all about you guys are going to have to tune in when is that episode going to air to um the new season starts first of january first of january you guys want to see the rest of that episode Pretty cool stuff. Oh, like <laughs> yeah, we're going to put that online. Oh, and I was just going to finish my spiel real quick. Um, so get the proper training before you go out. There's going to save you a ton of time, whether you're doing scuba diving or doing other stuff like Rick is going to demonstrate. Get the proper training and you're going to save so much time doing a production if you learn how to use the software as well. If you know what After Effects does, if you know what Pro Tools does, if you know what Premiere Pro and Photoshop do, you know, we teach classes here to get you up to speed quickly. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to spend all your time watching dumb tutorials online to make little cat animations or something. I mean, if you like cats, that's fine. But we'll show you to do, um, we'll, we'll get you up to speed quickly here and do whatever topic you want to do. If you're into spacemen or space women or whatever, <laughs> you can do that. So um, just had to pitch that. We have a class, by the way, in the winter VFX production that we're gonna be teaching here. Um, I teach it, of course, um, but you learn how to do this stuff and more. This is just a, a little slice of what we do in that class. We do miniatures, um, green screen production, all sorts of cool stuff, a little bit of practical effects, but you guys should check it out, CGT 210, visual effect production. Um, there's all sorts of other opportunities out there. Just go out there, find something you're passionate about. Like for me, it's the outdoors, um, it's the waterways, and make some media about it. Find something you're interested in about, make your animations about that. Make your paintings, your music, whatever. Find something you're passionate about, share that with other people, and learn new skills, new techniques. You never know how it will work in another aspect of your life. So, anyone have any questions about Bad luck from Namas, yeah. Yeah, where do you think you spent most of your time? In pre-production, production, or post? On this particular piece? Yeah. I don't know, post, I guess? Okay. Doing the effect work? I mean, it gets 90% there in 10% of the time. <laughs> and it's just that one pixel that you keep moving around, moving around. That's why deadlines are important. And that's why I needed the event to be tonight, not next week or another week, because I have other things that are due coming up real soon that I got to work on. So um, deadlines are very important. You're never 100% sap. There's stuff in here that I want to fix, but I'm putting it on YouTube. I have other stuff to do, paying clients and things to do. <laughs> this was a fun educational thing. I'm really glad that we all worked on it. And thanks to Kim Stricker for helping out, Abby and everyone else that helped out in the film. But um, you know, I'm moving on to something else now. Yeah, Randy. What, what was the most, like talking about time, what was the most time intensive uh, post production shot on the fact that you had the time on it? It's honestly super hard to say one particular thing over the other because it all takes a lot of freaking time. You know? Um, I didn't know if there was one shot that you just like, like just laboring over. No. Honestly, most of it was pretty easy. 
You know, um, you just want you know the tools. It just takes time to do this and do that and do that. You saw all the stuff I talked about. Just each thing takes an hour, a couple hours, and then you add up all of the images we looked at. It takes a lot of time. So there wasn't one particular thing that I was pulling my hair out over. I was just pulling my hair out over every shot. <laughs> you know, it's not. There wasn't any one particular thing. The one bad luck thing was when the footage disappeared. That was a big bummer. And going out and reshooting it, that was. The, you know, that was difficult. Not having a scuba suit to use and the proper equipment, it was a lot more difficult to hold your breath and try to get under and use a snorkel and kayaks and the current was taking the kayaks away and so on. It was more difficult. Um, but it's all difficult, it's all easy. It's, if it wasn't difficult, then I wouldn't do it. It would be boring, you know. So I like to do stuff that's Engaging, fun. Um, so yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. How much time was it before you, between finishing pre-production of this to here, like were you just still doing stuff like felt like a few days before? Or? Oh yeah, we're doing it yesterday. So that's how it goes. I mean, I had a draft rendered out, and I had a link, uh, a private link on YouTube, you know, a while ago. If all the computers crashed and this and that. You gotta have a backup plan. No. And I was, I was talking to someone earlier and, and they were laughing. Well, actually it was one of my students because I'm like, all right, I have a 4K version on a hard drive. I have an HD version. I have an SD version. I have a version on YouTube. And he's like, you have five plans? I'm like, you have to have multiple plans in this industry. If you only have one plan, then you don't have a plan. You gotta have a backup plan. In some cases, when it's live, like tonight, it's a live event. You gotta have multiple backup plans. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for listening. For coming out.